Hello and welcome back. My name is Kevin. This is episode five of Argument Parsing in Rust, version two. This time we're going to be talking about positional or free arguments. Now I use that term sort of interchangeably, so I'll probably say positional because that's the way they are, um, that's the verbiage that CLAP uses, um, but it's the same sort of thing. It, it means a argument that's based off of an index from your uh, from your actual binary so if you hear me say free arguments or positional it means the same thing if we come down into our into our argument documentation or our documentation there's a few more things we're going to add on to the previous video last time all we talked about was with name and how to create an arg instance next we're going to talk about uh, how to give it a help message and how to give it an index since we're speaking about free or positional. So let's come down, and this is going to be easier to explain with some actual practicals. We're going to remove these last two args, uh, arg3 and 4, because we, we only need two to demonstrate these purposes. We don't necessarily need 3 and 4 right now. We might add them back by later. All right, so we have arg1. The way we set these, uh, these properties is just like in that first demo is we'll do, uh, for right now, let's add a, a help message about it. All right, so this is where we're gonna be able to describe our, um, on our, our argument and in that help message, give the user some information about how to use this argument or what sort of values and things we, we can place in there. So we're gonna keep this simple and say, Let's do the same thing for arg2, but let's make it say something slightly different. Okay, so now we have uh, we have some help documentation for our arguments. Let's go ahead and build this and see what what came about. All right, now we have, this is our first argument, and this is this argument is only used if you need two things. Something that, uh, that CLAP does, interestingly, is it will wrap these help messages if they get too long. Now, it's not just going to wrap them down to the next line. It's going to wrap them and then intellig intelligently realign them to the line above. Let's see if we can get that in action. Now, it's only going to do this if it can determine the terminal width of the app of the terminal that it's being run in if it can't do that uh, it there's a few courses of action so let's make this a little bit smaller and now let's rerun that help and it should realign some things there we go so it realigned it placed uh, this message on the next line and then indented it over and then over here it determined that it was too line too long to even do that so it just placed it on the next line and then continued on so something kind of interesting that CLAP does automatically, and it makes your help messages look pretty nice. So having said that, I would keep, it when you're creating help messages for your arguments, whether they be args, flags, anything, um, you know, I would keep this part a reasonable length, um, but it's not to say that you can't go longer because CLAP will just, um, will simply wrap it whenever it sees that. Now, what if you wanted to wrap that help text at your own, uh, at your own sort of distance or length. That's totally possible to do as well. You just place a normal uh, slash in in there and it should wrap and realign. Let's try it real quick just to make sure. So remember right here we're putting this argument is and then after that it should realign. We need to rebuild it first though. So there we go, this argument is, and then it wraps and realigns right here, even though our terminal width could have fit the entire thing. So just something to know and something that you can use uh, in your own help messages if you need to. I'm gonna go ahead and take that out because we don't actually need that there for right now. So that's how you add a help message um, to your arguments. Let's also um, 
Let's do something where we can make arguments required or not. All we have to do is add required true. This is going to make argument two. Actually, you know what? We're going to do it to argument one. And I'll explain why in just a second. But this is going to make argument one required. Argument two is not required to be there. Let's rebuild. And rerun. Notice now our usage string has changed slightly. It now says argument one is required using angled brackets, which is a, a convention. And then uh, down here, you still have argument one and argument two. So let's run it without argument one or argument two and see what happens. And here we'll get an error message saying argument one was required, but it wasn't provided. Here's how you sh um, potentially should have run it. So let's say something, let's just say one. That's gonna run just fine. What happens if we put one and two for arg one and two? That also runs. If we go into three, that's where I get that same message saying, hey, um, argument three wasn't expected. Something to notice here about the context sensitive. Notice arg one and arg two, whereas before, if we scroll up here into the message, you see args. Yet here it says arg one and two. This is because arg one and two were actually used or attempted to be used. So the usage string went ahead and threw those in there for you. All right. So that's how we make uh, an argument required. To make it unrequired, simply delete the line. It's that simple. Uh, the reason why I switched it from argument two to argument one is if you think about it just for a second, if argument two is required and these are purely index based, how could you ever have an argument two without having an argument one? Now you might say, hey, I wanna have some value at, that comes last be mandatory and some of the ones before it are optional. As far as good CLI design goes, that's just not a good idea. Um, I can't say there in life there's very few absolutes, but in this one, if you're gonna have something required, all of the indexed based arguments before that should also be required. Now clap is going to uh, going to do that for you. So let's try that real quick. So notice here. Argument two is required, argument one is not. Let's see what happens. All right, this is something where, remember why I say I always run the help text right after I make a change? Because CLAP is designed, if it detects something, uh, some error in the way you know, either a somewhat of a logic error or something that isn't right, it's gonna panic, but it's gonna panic with a message as to what was wrong. In this case, it says found a positional argument which is not required with a which is not required with a lower index than a required positional argument, i.e. arg one, which is index one. So what it's telling us is that you have a higher index that's required and everything before it is not required. Now, what we could have done when designing this is make all of the ones before that required as well, but I don't necessarily like inserting additional code for people uh, when that may not be what they're expecting. So instead, I would rather it panic, and it's actually gonna panic unconditionally right now, even if we don't run the help text um, with you know a decent error message telling you what's wrong and how to fix it. So if we go back in here, the way to fix that is to either A, just make this required as well, or remove the required requirement from arc2. So we rebuild and rerun. Now we have two required arguments. Notice again the, help, the usage string changed. arg1 and arg2 are both required. If we do arg1, arg2 still isn't there. If we don't do any, it'll tell us both arguments were required but not supplied. So now on to indexes. Remember before, actually let me remove these requirements. Remember before we hit, we tried to place arg1 after arg2 and it can make your usage a little bit confusing. So there, clap has something called indexes. 
you can give an argument a specified index. In this case, we're going to give arg2 an index of 2 and arg1 an index of 1. Now, before, we never specified an index. In, in that instance, clap just assigns the next one available. So it was 1, 2. It was just behind the scenes. Uh, in this case, we're physically specifying. We want arg2 to be index 2. We want arg1 to be index 1. And there we go, they're back in order, arg1 and arg2. All right, so that's how we can define an index um, for a, a specified index. Now, uh, I didn't say it before, but indexes are one, they are based off of one, not off of zero. So that's a very, very, very important distinction. Uh, indexes start at one. Why is this? It's because index zero is usually your binary application. Uh, so index one is the first possible argument. Now, if we had other kinds of arguments in there, let's say flags and options and subcommands and all those things, these indexes only reference free or positional arguments. That's it. They don't reference, they're not in relation to any other style of argument, only to free or positional arguments. So we could have arg1 and arg2 and then 50 other arguments in between their flags and all kinds of other stuff. But these are still going to be free or positional index 1, positional index 2. All right. The one last thing I want to talk about before we move on to our next topic is uh, multiples. Now, multiples is somewhat of a confusing topic, so we're going to gloss over some of the specifics right now. Uh, but I simply want to say that you can have a single argument with multiple values. The way you do that is using multiple true. Now that we have multiple true, arg1 is going to accept multiple values. If we rebuild this, notice now we have arg1 dot dot dot, the, the, or the ellipses. Um, that is sort of standard practice for saying this accepts multiple values. So here, remember before, if we'd done arg1, that would work. But if we did arg1 and 2, it wouldn't work because it, there's, it's only expecting one, um, one argument. Now we can do 3, and we could even do, uh, we could do 4. We can do as many as you want. It's going to keep going. Actually, I think it goes all the way up to, uh, to a u64. Um, amount of values so good luck filling all of those ones in but that's how you can make an argument multiple now multiple even though it's set on an on an arg struct can mean several different things depending on the style of argument that's being used in this case it just means it's it accepts multiple values that's all for our, um for a positional argument now, one last thing I want to talk about, because this video we're almost at time, is what happens if you have multiple, but then you also have an argument after that. Let's call this arg2 again. How would this work? Again, based off of just general CLI design, it's not a good idea. Because how are we ever going to know when argument 1 stops and argument 2 starts? We're going to get that same panic, although it's going to have a different message. It's going to say only the positional argument with the highest index may accept multiple values. So over here, if we just simply move this to here, now arg2 accepts multiple values, arg1 does not, and this should work. No more panic. And notice now arg2. So the reason that is, is before we have one, two, three, and four, and five, and six. Right now, if I were to ask you which one of these is where arg2 starts, you could easily tell me right now it starts at number two and goes on. 
before, because it was multiple, arg1 was multiple, you have no idea of knowing where arg1 stops and arg2 starts. Now, there are ways to do that, um, and we'll get into those in some later videos when we speak specifically about multiple values. Uh, there's, we're going to have a video dedicated to that. There is a way that we can say or that we can make that work, but it's a slightly more advanced topic. So that is free or positional arguments in CLAP. I hope you learned something here. Uh, the next time, we're going to talk about how to get these values out of our arguments. So tune in next time for that. Thanks for watching.